Hey, good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I'm A.L. Johnson with Elevating Men and A.L. Johnson Life Insurance Agency. Um, I've got a very special guest with me today, and we're going to have a very serious conversation. So I need your full attention. Um, definitely like and share. This is an interactive live stream. And so you can ask your questions and leave your comments below, and we'll make sure we get those addressed. But the special guest that I have with me today is Miss Jackie Brown from the organization The Great Circle. And uh, they have a host of services that help our youth. And we want to find ways that we can help them serve our community better. And so how are you doing today, Ms. Brown? I'm doing good. Thank you so much for inviting me. I really appreciate you um, scheduling this time to talk about um, the children that we serve. Absolutely. It's important. Um, I don't mean to be cliche, but as they say, the children are our future. And yes. so we try to do everything that we can uh, here, you know, to help, uh, you know, provide a good future and a good path for them. And so can you tell us just a little bit about the Great Circle and what you all do as an organization? OK, so Great Circle, we are an organization that helps children who have experienced um, any type of trauma, abuse, neglect or even have mental health issues that they need some some services and resources for. And so we are across the whole state of Missouri. Um, we serve in different different areas of the state, Columbia, Springfield, St. Louis, um, St. James, Maryville, so M Marshall, Missouri, and Kansas City, Missouri. And then we have some little pockets of other areas that we provide services for um, children and family in need. That's awesome. Now, how long have you been doing this? So I have been working with foster care um, since uh, June of 2002. And um, but I have been with Great Circle for five years now. That's beautiful. What is it that uh, interested you in in social work in general? Because I know a lot of us, we have a heart for the community. We have a heart for the children. Uh, we want to be there for those who have been neglected or, or traumatized. Mm -hmm. But I know a lot of people that I know who have considered going into that line of work felt that they couldn't handle it, you know, as far as their heart, you know, getting connected to these children, seeing the things that they deal with and maybe not being able to help them in the way that they would like. And so um, what, what, what encouraged you to go that route? So it. I will say that it is, it really can be traumatizing for an individual to come and do this work. Um, but I had always wanted to be in the helping profession. Um, when I started my college years, I wanted to be a nurse. Um, but like most others, uh, sometimes that chemistry and <laughs> that math just gets you. And so I was really just kind of looking for um, other ways to um, be able to help people. And I had a a counselor who um, introduced me to an intro to human uh, human services course. Um, right. And I was able to meet some people from the children's division and kind of learn about foster care and how I could be helpful to those children in foster care. And I just kind of loved it from what I was hearing. And so I was able to do some, some, uh, interning with the Missouri Children's Division. And that's when I really um, was like, oh yeah, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to do. So I have, again, been in it since June of 2002. I started off as a case manager um, and then I became a supervisor and I actually worked for the Missouri Children's Division for 13 years. Um, wow. So that, I mean, it, there's some rough days there and it is really hard and it's emotionally taxing, but you have to learn how to uh, sometimes put that aside. And you also have to take really good care of yourself because if you don't, then it can be hard to continue to do this job every day. And I just really wanted to be able to do this. So my determination is kind of what has kept me in, in this um, arena. Well, we definitely want to uh, commend you and uh, the community appreciates you and what you're doing, everything that's going on at the gray circle, uh, because it is important. It is important. A question that I have when it comes to uh, foster children and foster care and that whole situation, what have you found in your experience to be maybe the top two or three reasons why children end up in foster care? So children end up in foster care either from physical abuse um, and or sexual abuse, neglect, mental health of the parents, drug abuse of the parents, domestic violence of the parents. So and sometimes we even have 
older youth that come in because they're running away a lot or they're having issues in the mm -hmm. home, getting along with the family members, and it's causing a lot of trauma and chaos. And so those are the, the main reasons why children do come into care. So once a child comes into care, can you give us an idea of what that intake process looks like? So once the allegations of child abuse and neglect are made, um, there's an investigator with the Children's Division that goes out and investigates um, the allegations. And if it is determined that that child is in danger, um, then the investigator has to uh, petition the court to request that that child comes into care. And so ultimately it is up to the judge on whether or not there is enough reasons or the allegation significant enough that that child is not safe in the home. And so then we have to bring that child into care. Um, what my agency does then is once that child comes into care, um, we begin to case manage the, the family, which means that we offer services such as um, visits, parent-child visits, um, therapy. We offer psychological evaluations. We connect them to the community psychiatric resources. Um, we offer, sometimes we have to offer parents uh, substance abuse assessments. Uh, we do, we don't particularly do UAs, but we contract out with the agency to do UAs to monitor the parents' continued drug use. Um, and we work with the, we go in the home and we work with the parents, um, just kind of making sure that they are getting those services and resources that we need. Because our ultimate goal is to reunify those children back with that parent, because that's where children belong. They belong with their biological family and that's where they thrive best. Although a lot of people don't seem to believe that, but they do. And so that is our number one goal is to reunify and and get them back so that they can be safe and, and be productive individuals in our community. Um, so I understand the main causes that, you know, cause these children to end up in foster care or having to come to a service like yours. Once you receive them, what are the main problems that you find that they're dealing with? So I know that they're overcoming, you know, trauma, but, um, you know, outside of that, what things do you see the children specifically dealing with? So the children are dealing with, um, first off, parents who have been sometimes abused and neglected themselves. And so what we're seeing is, is that 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 parent is abused and neglected. So then either they turn to drugs or they end up in domestic violence relationships or they have mental health, unaddressed mental health needs. And so that one is what the children are experiencing. Um, some of the other things are is that children um, themselves have been abused and neglected, which affects their development, which can then cause different behaviors. Sometimes it can be um, aggressive behaviors where they can be physical, physically aggressive with other um, with other kids their age, or sometimes even adults, they can have severe tantrums. They can sometimes even be withdrawn and they don't want to interact with anybody. And so we see a wide range of, of behaviors from a child that has been abused and neglected. Well, so in seeing that uh, those wide range of trauma responses, um, mm -hmm. I understand that most people, when they deal with trauma, everyone heals differently. Yes. And so what does the process look like to find out specifically how to deal with each individual child when you have such a large organization and the need is so great? How do you individualize that? So it really has to start with the family. And so when we when we start working with a family, we have certain things that we have to do. Uh, we visit with the parents initially weekly because we want to find out their story. We want to get their side of what they think is going on and also how um, how they how we can help them. We're not in there to try to tell them, oh, you need to do a, B, C, and D. No, we want to know how can we help you? What do you think would be the best way? And then we offer, we give them suggestions and we offer them resources that we think may be able to meet that need that they're looking the help for. And so our goal is to have that parent be an active role in this 
in this um, part because they have to do the work in order for their child to come back home. If we did it all, then that reunification would be successful. And so we have to sit down with them and, and find out from them what is it that they need or what is it that they're looking for and how can we help? One of the uh, you know mottos that we have here is so on our platform, Elevating Men, um, it's kind of our tagline that we're trying to rebuild men so that they can rebuild their families and we rebuild better communities in the process. And so, you know, we talked about the trauma that the kids are experiencing, but they got there because of the trauma from the parents, you know, whatever mm -hmm. they were dealing with. And you just kind of spoke to, um, you know, providing services for them and kind of trying to get an idea of what, what happened. What have you found is going on with these parents? Um, you know, that ends up in a situation where the children have to end up in foster care. What are you seeing? Um, as far as the trauma that they may have gone through or what experiences are you hearing kind of repetitively um, that these parents are dealing with? Well, um, a lot of unaddressed um, trauma. They either did not, you know, seek out the therapy um, or maybe they do have a mental health diagnosis that they are not, um, they're not getting treated. Um, it could be, um, just sometimes severe depression where they just do want to deal with whatever they are going through. And then as we all know, is that when, when people are hurt, um, especially emotionally, they think that drugs will be the answer. And so they, then they turn to, you know, it starts off with marijuana and then, you know, after a while marijuana doesn't work. So then it leads to something else. And so usually that's a lot of what we see. And, and it's unfortunate because um, if they were open to um, getting help, then some of those issues could be addressed. Now, we do unfortunately see a lot of the cycle um, of, of this foster care system. Uh, we've had many children that were in care themselves. And then wow. they have children and then those children come into care. And so, so like a, a, you know, when they say generational curses, it's, it's kind of something like that. Yes. Yes. Wow. wow. Yes. Um, we've got a comment here from one of our uh, faithful followers, Miss uh, Maroney. She asked, what can we as members of the community do to support your organization? And she also asked, are there opportunities for mentoring foster children? Details, please. And so can you kind of address that for us? Absolutely. Thank you so much for your question. Um, well, what I would say that what the community could do um, for a great circle is that we, you know, do have needs um, where children come into care. They may not have clothing um, sometimes. Um, so clothing, um, diapers, toiletries, so like deodorant, toothbrushes, um, sometimes even just nice little toys, blankets for children, because we do like to celebrate them. We like to celebrate their birthdays. Um, we always have a need during Christmas time, um, because as a contracted agency, we have to make sure that our children have Christmas. And so usually when we usually kind of start in September, October, and we start reading out to individuals to say, can you sponsor a kid? Um, I know two years ago, um, my staff and I, we just we just reached out to people that we knew and we we said we have a kid this age. This is their um, their sex. This is their favorite color. This is the sizes that they wear. Um, and this are these are their three wishes. And we had a lot of good responses where people were taking names of the children and and buying gifts, Christmas gifts for the children. And so I could say that was one of our best Christmases ever because every child was adopted and we were able to get um, we were able to get Christmas for all of our children. So That's those crazy. are those are the biggest ways to support in regards to the mentoring. Um, most definitely we could use mentors. Um, of course, we have to background checks on any individuals that are interested in being a mentor. So for the mentoring piece, that would be something that I can talk to them in more in detail because I would have to, of course, go back to my organization to find out, you know, what's the best way that we can set our children up with mentors. Now, there are a couple of agencies out there that do contract with us to do mentoring services. 
Um, but those are paid services. And we try to steer away from those services because we want somebody in the community that can be a lifelong um, individual, um, lifelong person in that child's life. And so, um, but for the mentoring, most definitely you can reach out to me. And I'm sure uh, Mr. Johnson will make sure that you, my contact information will get out there so that you can reach out to me individually and we can have those discussions uh, personally about the mentoring. But okay. we could use them. We really could use them for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, we got uh, another question here. It says, is respite still available to help foster parents? Yes, respite is still a service that is um, is in great need as well. Um, for to become a respite provider, you just have to reach out to one of the foster care agencies that license the respite providers, um, and then you would just um, connect with some of the fo current foster parents and then provide respite services to them. Perfect, perfect. Um, mm -hmm. And when you spoke on the mentoring piece, I know you said to contact you directly. Um, do you all work with any of the other agencies that currently have mentoring programs uh, that aren't paid that um, can kind of help facilitate that process? So I, I would have to say one of our biggest ones is Big Brothers, Big Sisters. Um, we we make referrals to them and because we want, like I said, we want our children to have a lifelong individual come into their lives and be that support for them. Um, and and I think that is going to be the best way to um, that doesn't deal with the paid. Um, big brothers, big sisters, of course, always needs mentors. And so I say that is one way, too, that you could um, most definitely help in that realm. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, so I had a question here. We spoke a little bit off camera and you talked about the fact that the number one goal is to keep the child with their biological parents. Mm -hmm. When that fails, then you move to, you know, maybe a sibling, an adult sibling, um, and mm -hmm. then you go to the grandparents and then you go to the aunts and uncles. And so foster care is really that last option. Mm -hmm. Once you get to that point, how do you match the, the family with a child? Um, you know, are there any certain things that you look for to make sure that they may mesh well, or is it just kind of a, you know, how, how, how does that work? So we do, we do try to match. Um, we look at um, the age of the child. Um, we, foster parents can select when they become licensed, they can select what age they are interested in. And so usually we want to, of course, keep a child in the same community because they will be visiting with their parent. Um, we are looking for uh, a family or an individual. It doesn't necessarily have to be a married couple. You can be a single individual and be a foster parent, but we're looking for someone who can meet that need of that child. And so if they are able to do that and they can be available to that child, because there are requirements like taking children to doctor's appointments, so like vision, hearing, dental, all of those things need to be met for that child. And so just um, doing that and being able to help um, with, with meeting the needs of the child. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Losing um, my train of thought. <laughs> oh, no problem at all. No problem at all. Um, one, one of the things that we had discussed uh, the other day when we were talking is the fact that a lot of times children will go into a foster home and then they have to be replaced uh, because, you know, whatever may be going on in that particular home or maybe their personalities don't mesh well. Mm -hmm. um, can you kind of speak to that process and some of the challenges that you face there? So a lot of the challenges that we face and and I say this um, because this is what I have seen. Um, we have families who are interested in um, becoming um, foster parents, but honestly, some of them become foster parents because they want to adopt. And our goal, foster care, is not to just adopt children out. Foster care is to come in and help families um, kind of resolve their issues that they have and be reunited again. And so our number one goal is to place children back in the home. And so we have some families who may not quite understand that. And so then they may not quite understand trauma and how it affects the child, 
how those behaviors, what those behaviors look like. Some families are not able to deal with that. And so we have um, a number of times where families have requested that that child be moved. And so then we're moving children from place to place to try to try to find out. And it makes it even harder because we do not have enough families. And so we have children that are really just kind of bouncing. And sometimes we take, we have families that will take a child um, because they know that child needs a place to stay, but they actually may not be the best fit for that child, but that child needs a place to stay. And so then you have some things that don't work out specifically because of that reason. So is there any interim process or so I've got, um, you know, a parent or a child comes in uh, to foster care or seeking foster care um, in the in-between time until a parent is found? What, how do you all address their needs uh, in the meantime? So there are a couple of emergency shelters, um, Salvation Army Children's Shelter and a Synergy um, Children's Shelter. Synergy is up north of the river and Salvation Army is off of Linwood. And so we use those, utilize those shelters at times when we're not able to find a placement. And so we we diligently then begin the search for relatives. And so we're asking the parents, do you have any brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, anyone that you may know? Or what about on the father's side? Do you know any of their father's family? And so we're looking on both sides of the family to try to find family members so that these children can be placed with them. That's a, uh, man, I feel for those children. I mean, I really couldn't mm -hmm. imagine um, being at a shelter um, waiting for someone to, you know, quote unquote, choose me. Mm -hmm. And then for those children who get placed in a foster home and for whatever reason, it doesn't work out because maybe the parents had an adoption mentality versus fostering. Um, and then they're back in the same spot again. That's, mm -hmm. uh, that's terrible. Mm -hmm. It's terrible. Yeah, and it's surprising uh, because some kids, they like being at the shelter. And a lot of it is because they don't want to have to form that attachment. Because when you think about a shelter, you're thinking about staff who, you know, they they come to work for eight hours. Then the next person comes in for their eight hour shift. Then the right. next person, then the next person. So they're going in and out like a revolving door with individuals that they don't have to build a relationship with because they don't want to get hurt again. And so mm. we have some kids that will tell us, just take me back to the shelter. Well, we can't do that. So it, it, it really is sad. And so we just really need more homes that can um, understand what the children really need. And they just need someone who can understand that they have experienced a lot and that they are just trying to make it through day to day. Understand, understand. Uh, I've got another question here from the audience. Uh, Mr. Uh, A.L. Boykin from Dinner and Dialogue. He's actually a part of our Elevating Men's panel. He asked, is the parent required to enter into and complete any type of development program once their child is removed from them? So we do have um, a couple parenting um, classes that we um, re we refer them to. And so there are court orders that are put in place for the parents to participate in services, but ultimately it's still up to that parent on whether or not they're going to participate. Um, we do have a lot of parents, unfortunately, that don't participate in the services that are offered to them. Um, they They don't they don't do the substance abuse assessments or they don't do the um, sometimes the visits. They don't even visit their kids. Um, sometimes they do not do the domestic violence classes that we may have to refer them to. And so it really just depends on that that parent. Sometimes they're just not ready. We have parents who unfortunately put drugs over over their children or they put that relationship with a male or female um, before that child because that's what they know and that's where they want to be in that moment. Some parents are just not ready. Wow. I, I've got to ask you this because uh, here, here on this platform, we have a lot of really deep conversations about community issues. We've had roundtables on fatherhood, on you know, raising your children and just, just a variety of topics. Um, in your opinion, because you're saying things at the at the end of the road, the point that we mm -hmm. try to never get to, 
And mm -hmm. so uh, from your from your opinion, what is the biggest issue um, in the homes in our community that's that's causing all of this? Because when you have children who are broken, um, that are raised by broken parents, they go out and they break other parts of the community. And so for us mm -hmm. to really get the community under control, we've got to start with the root. Um, mm -hmm. And so what what do you think is, uh, what would you say is the, the big problem? I'm sorry. Oh, no problem. This is what happens when you're an on-call supervisor. <laughs> so um, the there's not enough preventative services. That's what we really need in our community to be able to um, truly help these help the families. And it needs to start from it needs to start from birth uh, because then that's where you catch it. Um, Gray Circle has a program called home visiting and home visiting is working with parents who have children ages zero to three. And what we do is we go in the home, we provide education to them about abuse, neglect, child development, all of that, so that we're hoping that they never have to see the foster care system. And so we're the hopes is, is that if we start them when the when they have a young child, then maybe we can give them that education and that support and services that they need or even connect them to other community resources so that they may not have to experience um, homelessness or um, substance abuse, su significant substance abuse or even domestic violence. And so being able to, ex you know, get get there before they move to the foster care system. That's our goal. That's our goal. And I think that's what needs to happen is that more preventative services and catching some of these families in the beginning, like maybe hospitals, you know, having more resources that hospitals are aware, I'm going to refer this family to this program or to this program, because if you can catch it from day one, then you're less likely to see a lot of what we see once they get to the foster care system. Because I, I'm one of those people, I really believe that people are good, you mm -hmm. know, in general. And when we see these people who are broken, there's something that, that caused it. That's not, you know, their true selves. And most right. people want to work to improve, but they really don't know how to do it. Um, right. And like you said, when a person has to go, it's easy for us to say in our state of wholeness that, you know, you can Google resources. That's easy. You know, it's easy to find what's out there because you have Google. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, in, in your opinion, what do you think is the, the barrier? I know you said having more preventive services, catching them early, but w what's the issue with getting the message to them? Um, yeah. What could it be found there? So there are so many factors that, that prevent families from getting this information. You got to think about um, homelessness, you have to think about unemployment, underemployment, all of the things that um, the the state, the nation is dealing with today. Those are reasons. I mean, how can you get families the information if they don't have a cell phone? How can you get um, families to resources if they don't have the transportation to get there? Um, how can you connect with them if they don't have a home to go to? That makes it really, really difficult. And so you have fans who are dealing with a lot of, of things that have happened to them that unfortunately they can't just seem to get over. And so it's really not that easy. And and we we say, oh, they can change if they want to. Sometimes it's just not that easy. And I yeah. have found myself telling people that Parents don't just wake up saying, I want to abuse my kid. That's not how that works. Right. I don't think that there's anybody who just says, oh, I'm going to abuse my kid today. And don't get me wrong. I, I know that we have seen some really serious, serious abuse that has happened to children. I mean, serious from, mm -hmm. you know, lifelong injuries to death. And it's hard for an individual to say, yeah, right. Because that child has been sick, severely abused, mm -hmm. um, but they don't. There's there's factors that play into that. And, and those are the things that I mentioned before, the mental health, the homelessness, the underemployment, um, the substance abuse, the domestic violence. All of those play a role. Sometimes their own family members play a role in how 
that individual functions because there it's a long lasting family dysfunction. Yeah. Well, you're you, you're seeing a lot. You, you're seeing yes. a lot. Yes. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, a question that I had too. So you know, just as a parent, e even myself, I know that I'm a better parent now than I was, you know, 10 mm -hmm. years ago, because you live and you learn and mm -hmm. you find new tools and uh, avenues and ways of parenting um, that, that just improves you as a parent over time. And so I'm just kind of curious, um, on average, what is the age of the parents that are having to bring their children into foster care? And at what age are these children on average coming in? So we have um, oh, a wide range Um most of them, their ages are at least 18. The parents are 18 and above. Now we have had some, some teenagers um, where they were 16, 17 that have had babies and those babies have come into care. But usually when that happens, then that teen comes into care as well. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, I see. I see. but yeah, but we have, newborns that come into care um, because they've been drug exposed or either the parent is homeless and they have absolutely nowhere to go to take that child. And so that child has to unfortunately come into foster care. And we, um, the oldest child that we've had come into care, actually Missouri can bring them to care up until the age of 17. And then we can actually keep them in care until they're 21. I see. I see. So because my, my initial thought on that was, you know, these are probably, you know, young parents, um, you know, that are mm -hmm. having most of these issues. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, we I th usually it's young. I've seen middle 30s. Um, you rarely see parents in their 40s unless unless it's a specific type of situation. Usually you kind of see those older, older teens, the older youth. When right. they come into care, then their parents might be that age, but mostly it is younger, younger individuals. What What, what do you think is, uh, you know, the issue there just when, it, and I understand the children with raising children, that's a lot of pressure. But when you get into the, say, mid-20s age, age range, what issues do you feel that they're having with parenting? Immaturity, um, lack of education, in the sense of sometimes formal education, okay. lack of child development education, and their own trauma that they may have experienced in their own family as a child. That You know, one, one recurring thing is I'm hearing is trauma as a child affecting you as an adult and in mm -hmm. turn affecting the way that you treat other people, including your own children. So what can we do as parents to possibly identify any traumas that our children may be facing that maybe we're even unaware of things that could contribute to them not being the adults that they could be. How can we recognize those things early and, and treat them before this problem just continues on? I think just maintaining good communication with your child, making sure that your child feels comfortable coming to you to talk to you um, whenever they may be thinking anything, being really observant with your child and noticing any behavioral changes um, because they can be traumatized um, by other individuals. Like something could be going on at school, not saying that the trauma is coming from that parent. It could be from school. It could be some of their classmates. It could be um, times we've seen other family members sexually abuse children. And so you have that whole outside piece that you have to look at as well. And so those are the things that I think communication, uh, being very observant for your child and making the environment to a place for your child where they can feel like they can come and tell, I can tell my mama, I can tell my daddy anything. And wow. so that's what I try to do with my child. I am, I try to be open. My husband is open and we, we let her know that, you know, anything is going on. You can come to us and you can talk to us because that's, you need to be your child's safe space. Right. They need right. to be able to come to you with anything. And that is the most important thing, because if they don't feel like they can come to you, then that's where you start to see kind of the, um, kind of the suicide thoughts, um, the the cutting 
all of those self-harming things that you may see sometimes in a child. Um, we've heard so many, so many times in the news more in the last couple of years where children as young as five, six, seven are killing themselves. Wow. Sometimes it's because they don't feel like they can talk to their parent or sometimes things are just so, so, so bad for them that they feel like they have no way out. And I think if the parents are being observant with their child, noticing everything, like if their attitude is different or maybe they're not eating or maybe they're not sleeping well, then talking to them and find out what's going on so that you can really get to know um, what that child is experiencing. Yeah, yeah. So what does that second layer look like? So say if it gets past the parent um, and they're a school aged child, are you noticing that, you know, teachers, principals, other school workers are possibly picking up on some of these issues? And are you all getting alerted um, that way through the school system um, in some instances or, or doctors? How does that work when it's someone outside of the family? I would say, honestly, the school districts are getting a lot better with um, paying attention to children. Um, they have systems that when you have now that they're using, you know, um, tablets, things of that nature. Some schools have systems that will alert certain individuals when they're um, doing searches like through Google for specific things. So let's say um, you have a child that Googles how to um, hang themselves or something of that nature. Then it gets alerted to an individual. Sometimes it could be a social worker. It could be another individual that's inside assigned by the school um, that gets that alert. And then they go out and they reach out to the child and kind of find out what's going on, talk to the parents, the family, and see if there's anything that they that can be put in place. And so I, I think that the, the community, the world is um, reacting a lot better to children and how they are functioning in school because um, there's a lot of bullying that happens that causes some of these things and and while I think there still needs there's a lot of work that still needs to be done I think the community is getting better with responding to things of that nature to help children. Mm -hmm. um, now earlier you mentioned that your number one goal is to keep them with their biological family. And you also mentioned that parents don't wake up and just say, hey, I'm going to abuse my child today, even though we may think that um, there's usually something behind that. And so what about a good parent who made a bad decision? Um, they made a mistake um, they fell on hard times and they couldn't you know, take care of their child and they end up mm -hmm. in the system. What would be your advice to that parent to get their child back in the home? I would say um, utilize the support that is in front of you. Um, a lot of people say, I don't want them in my business. We hear that a lot. We hear that a lot with, with families. And I get that because we don't want a lot of people in our business. But the, what I have told families in the past is that, unfortunately, we are here now. And my goal is to help you get your taking sure that um that we offer them the services that are really truly going to benefit them. And that's what I was saying earlier. I don't want to give a family a service just because, just because, and put that in place. It really needs to be something beneficial that will truly help the family get to where they need and want to be. Because it's going to be a waste of time for everybody if I just, let's say I put, um, substance abuse treatment in for a family that not even abusing drugs. Well, that's kind of a waste of time. Why would I do that? You know, and so just making sure that we are putting services in place that are going to actually benefit and then listening to the parent, because a lot of times they're not, they don't feel like they're being heard. Um, and so our role as the case managers is also to listen to them and then, you know, take in that information and ask them, you know, how can we help you? Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, we got a comment here from uh, Mr. Melvin Brown. How you doing, sir? Thanks for joining us. Um, it says he's uh, currently fighting a battle now with the Children's Division of Jackson County. They may have 
they have my niece's children in the system and have done nothing but cause me grief. Sadly, I'm the only family member who has been diligent in attending the court hearings, IEP meetings, conference calls, et cetera. Um, is there any way that you could just kind of maybe speak a little life into that situation and give him a little encouragement, maybe a little advice? Well, first of all, um, I am sorry that you have to experience that. And sometimes working with the system cannot be easy. Um, it is just making sure that you're communicating with the case manager, or sometimes you may even have to communicate with the, the case manager's um, supervisor. If you don't feel like things are, um, if you don't feel like you're getting the information or the help or the support you need. And so it really just, every situation is different. So it's really kind of hard to to say exactly, but those usually the specific things. And then sometimes, um, and all families can't do this, but sometimes families just get an attorney to just help represent them in court and be able to speak for them in court because sometimes it just requires that. You have individuals who um, interact with families a certain way. Sometimes we do not know why. Um, I can speak for my agency that we welcome family members. We welcome family members um, and we want to make sure that that family member understands the process and understands what's going on and understand what our goal is. Because, again, our goal is to reunify with that parent. So that's what we're going to be working towards. And so it just there's a lot of factors that come into play. But I would say for sure. Um, you know, making sure to try to communicate with the case manager, their supervisor. And then sometimes if that doesn't work, you might have to take take it a little higher um, and have someone else kind of look into the situation and see how they can um, help move things along. Makes sense. Um, I got a private question here. Pulled up. And so someone was asking, um, now that marijuana is legal in Missouri, how does that affect a custody case um, when it comes to, uh, you know, foster parenting and things like that? Does that disclude someone or is are there any changes now that the marijuana is legal? So, no, not at this point. There aren't any changes. If, um, if, if there is marijuana usage, um, we will not allow you to be a foster parent. Um, and it is looked at now. The one difference with that is is that when it comes to biological parents, uh, we're not automatically removing children from the parents based off of marijuana alone. It okay. used to be, it, it used to be for any drug, but they have been making some changes um, with, with that piece, um, with the marijuana piece, as far as removing children. Cause we used to just like automatically <laughs> remove ba newborn yeah. babies if they're born drug exposed um, or if a parent, is using marijuana, but it really, it hasn't changed, unfortunately, yet. And I can't see in this system that it will, um, just because of sometimes the nature, depending on the person, marijuana can still alter a state of, of being. And it's, it's all about making sure that you are um, available and able to um, parent that child with a clear, full, mind. And so everybody is different. Um, maybe it will one day. I'm not sure, but it's it's really sensitive right now because we're dealing with child abuse and neglect and we have to take all of those pieces away from that situation that will alleviate or um, alleviate a child from being abused again, especially once they're in a foster home. Makes sense. So I want to go back a little bit to the qualifications since we're there. And so mm -hmm. for someone who's watching this and they say, hey, I want to I want to help. And uh, what, what are the qualifications? Uh, what 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 are you guys looking for as far as background checks, et cetera? What would disqualify someone from being able to uh, be a foster parent? So in order to become a foster parent, you must be at least 21 years of age. And um, and you like I said before, you do not have to be married. You can be a single individual, male or female. 
um, who, who is interested in helping to care for kids and working with the team in whatever goal that is set for the family. Those are the biggest qualifications. There is training that is in that that comes into play about 27 hours of training that you must be willing to go through. As far as the background checks, you will have to do fingerprints. Um, we also do the family care safety registry, which um, also then checks the system to make sure that you don't have any, um, let's say maybe something with the school. Maybe there was an incident with the school that might not show up on other things. Um, the family care safety registry will show that. And then we have a system where we run um, child abuse and neglect checks to make sure that you have not been involved in any previous child abuse or neglect. You have not been named the, the perpetrator um, or the one who committed the abuse on a child. And so those are the main qualifications. So if all that comes back clear, then you are good to go. Um, you must be able to show financially that you can care for a child. So for example, if you're not employed, then you will not be able to become a foster parent because we have to be able to show that you're not just relying solely on the uh, monthly maintenance that will be provided to you as an individual to care for a child. So it's not solely based on that. So those are the biggest things and just being willing to um, take a child in um, and, and be able to give that child the security and the um, support that they need to be able to make it through. Got it. Um, on the financial piece, because children, you know, that is a financial responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, and so is there a certain income guideline that you look at? Or the parent, I know you said that they have to be employed, but is there like a, a minimum income level that you all consider? And along with that, um, the uh, monthly maintenance, uh, what does that look like? You don't have to give exact numbers, but, you know, just for a person that wants to know, you know, is it going to be sufficient? How much would I be coming out of pocket, et cetera? <laughs> like? Well, those are good questions. And so, um, no, you do not. There's not a minimum income that you need to make. Um, you just have to be employed. Um, the as far as the monthly maintenance, it there's uh, different amounts based on the age, um, and so it just depends on what age you t you do take. Um, it will depend on that. And so I will say I I tell people this is one of the reasons why they say you must be employed because that maintenance is not going to completely help you take care of that child. I mean, we all know those those who have biological children know how much it takes to um, to parent a child completely. And right. I will honestly say that that maintenance amount is not enough. So now, like, there's definitely isn't something you get in it for the money. It's, it's, right, right. right. <laughs> So we, but what we are responsible for is making sure that they have the clothing that they need. So particularly my agency, what we do is um, if a parent, if a family buys clothing for a child, then they give us the receipt and we reimburse them for that because they are not responsible for paying for those clothing items for that child. We are. Um, and, and then like with the children's division, they have a voucher system that they use um, to help support getting clothing for for a child. And yeah. so, yeah, so and there's different things. And so we do reach out to the community um, where we ask for assistance. Like if we have a family that says I'm in need of this, I'm in need of that. Um, sometimes we have relatives who take in kids. They might need dressers, beds, things of that nature to be able to actually have the kid in the home. Sometimes with a baby, they may need a car seat. They may need a crib. And so we reach out to our community individuals to help us meet those needs of, of the families. Beautiful, beautiful. And uh, it's almost time for us to wrap up. There's a couple really good questions in the comment section. So I want to address those. Um, one we have here, it says, uh, it's a really good question. If you had an opportunity to fix the foster care system, what are the top three changes you would make? Oh, that is a good question. That is a good question. Thank you for that question. Um, I think the three things would be, again, more preventative uh, services. 
I think um, we need to figure out how can we help families without bringing them into the foster care system? Um, because as the children's division, what they do is that they have um, family centered service workers where they the children are still intact in the home with the biological parent and then they provide services to them. Um, that needs to be broader. There needs to be more workers where we can provide that to the children. I also think that we need to pay the workers more. Workers need to be paid more because this is a really hard job and there is just not enough support for them to be able to support the families. And I think the other thing would be to um, sometimes, and this is just, this last one is my personal belief. I think there needs to be somewhat of a change of mindset because you have some individuals who think that children, when something happens in the home, that children need to be removed immediately. And I don't necessarily agree with that. I think that there are certain things that can be done um, to um, to help the family so that the child doesn't have to be in foster care. So I think those are the, the biggest things. That, and you have a lot of people who are making decisions for this system that have never done the work. And so that's where some of the things that that we see that sometimes become issues for us because people are making decisions that are just not right for the families. Great responses. Very, great responses. Um, and I could definitely see that in the paying the workers more because uh, I even feel the same way about teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, the absolutely. role is so important and mm -hmm. for the salary that they get, it just really doesn't justify the work that they do. So I mm -hmm. can definitely appreciate that. Um, we've got another question here from uh, Lauren Jones. He's also a member of the Elevating Men's panel. Um, he asks, is there a difference between being a foster parent and adopting a child? What, what's the difference there? So when you're talking about the foster care system, um, there is a difference. Fostering a child is that you are taking care of that child daily um, in, in being a part of the team in hopes to reunify that child. And so your goal is your goal is to actually help the child hopefully get back home. Um, adopting a child is making that child permanently yours. You are the going to be named the parent. Um, and so what happens is, is when you have a child that's in foster care, if that child is not able to go home, then a lot of times the goal is changed to adoption. And then whoever that sometimes whoever that child is placed with, they are allowed to adopt. Well, what happens in an adoption is, is that there has to be a termination of parental rights hearing where you have to terminate the biological parent's rights in order to adopt a child. And then once that termination has been done and it's been granted, then you have as the resource, you have a hearing, and then they basically legally make that child yours. You get a whole new birth certificate where your name is there um, as almost as if you gave birth to that child. And so that is the difference. Fostering is just you're taking care of this child. In the meantime, adoption is you're making it a permanent, that child a permanent individual to your family. Uh, Ms. Brown, I had, I had a question uh, specific to our platform, Elevating Men. Mm -hmm. um, we're all about rebuilding men. Um, and so my question, a lot of these children that are ending up in foster care, are you seeing that there's a, a man in the home or a part of the situation? Or do you find this to be an issue that affects single mothers mostly? Or do you see a lot of you know, uh, two-parent households that still have the same issues? Or, Unfortunately. Or Unfortunately, we do not see enough fathers in place when children are coming into care. Now, it has increased, I would say, from the time when I first started working in this system to now, it has increased. We do have more children that are being placed with their biological fathers. 
And so that's great, but it still needs a lot of work. I mean, we have just a lot of children that um, that come into care. We reach out to the fathers because that's what we we have to do that um, because we want that father to be involved because we know the importance of a child having their father in their lives and how that can impact them. And some fathers, they don't, they just sometimes don't want to get involved with the system. They just don't want to. And you know, there's parts of me that can understand that. Um, but then it's like, you know, this is your child. This is your yeah. child and you should right. want to be involved. But, you know, we can't make people want to do that. And so um, I, I do wish that there was more more things out there to um, like elevating men and to be able to reach out to fathers and and help them um, figure out what they need to do to be a part of their child's life. Got it. That is encouraging to hear that it isn't as bad as it was, but you know, it sounds like there's still a lot of work to do. Yes. Um, I've taken a ton of notes here. I feel like I'm, I'm in class. <laughs> um, you just gave us so much great information and uh, I've been filling this notebook and there's a purpose behind all of these interviews. And so for the past several months, um, we've interviewed, you know, from the mayor of, of Compton, California, to uh, directors with Big Brothers and Big Sisters, yourself mm -hmm. and other community leaders. And we're really just trying to find uh, the answer to some of these issues so that we can create an action plan moving forward. And so my last question is, um, in the perfect world, right, um, mm -hmm. what message do you feel that we need to get across in our community to stop this problem that you specifically deal with? A perfect world. Hmm. We always say we want, we need to break the cycle, but sometimes it's really hard to say, where do you start first? Um, I, I think again, um, if we can start when children are very young, when they're just born and give parents some education, like when we see that there may be some things that may be missing, um, connecting them to that resource so that they can learn more about child development, about child abuse and neglect. Um, I think that is the biggest thing because um, what we see now is just a lot of trauma out there. And if we can put those resources in place to help alleviate that trauma, then that's the best thing that we can do. Agreed. Agreed. Um, just that sparked another thought when you, you, you said start early, like so many times you said, it. you know, start mm -hmm. early, start early. And I completely agree with that. And so can you envision a program or maybe a class that could be added to the children's curriculum to help them understand themselves better possibly identify their own traumas and help them to work through it. Is there anything currently in the school system that helps children in that way? Um, or is that something that you see that uh, there's opportunity for? I think most definitely there's more opportunities. But as I had stated before, I think schools are doing better with having those conversations with the students. Um, my daughter goes to school in Raytown and um, the social worker just reached out to me last week and and they're um, doing um just a course with the parents that they also work with the kids on and really talking to the kids about um, coming to the council when they have problems or when they have issues and things of that nature. But I do believe that there is always a need for more education for our, our youth um, and our children so that they understand what trauma is. They understand um, how it makes them feel. Why do they feel a specific way? Because sometimes they don't even know why they feel the way they feel. Right. And so just really educating them. Hopefully, you know, somebody can come up with a great educational program for um, young children, the, the in between teenage and the teenage um, youth to be able to help them identify and learn how to deal with um, the, their emotions and or the trauma they have experienced. Awesome. Awesome. So I'm going to share a little something with you with Elevating Men. Right now we're working on things relating to life path. 
And so I'm not taking some notes here. We definitely need to address the emotional piece, but I'm going to share with you what we have so far and just kind of get your idea, um, you know, from your position. And so there's uh, four concepts that we're working on. One is the four quarters of life. We want to teach young men early the value of time mm-hmm. and help them understand that you only live so long. And so mm-hmm. you, in different areas of your life, you should be focused on different things. We live to approximately 80 years old. And so if you split that into four quarters, you know, zero to 20, 20 to 40, 40 to 60, 60 to 80, zero to 20, we encourage children to learn as much as possible, experience as much as possible while they're in a controlled environment. And -hmm. within that, try not to make any major mistakes, you know, no legal trouble and none of that sort of stuff, but Mm -hmm. get all those experiences out early. Once Mm -hmm. you get the age of 20, we encourage young men to focus on your your passion and your income. And so making sure that when the time comes for you to have a family, which should be intentional, um, you know, that you already have that foundation laid and, and you can support them financially because a couple times within this, we've mentioned, you know, the financial struggle um, is what, what hurts a lot of families. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the next phase, we encourage them to start looking towards giving back to the community. And so Mm -hmm. from 40 to 60, if you've done the other part right, it's time for you to start giving back things like elevating men, you know, working with different organizations, giving back to the next generation. And if you've done all of that correctly from 60 to 80, you should just kind of be enjoying the fruits of your labor, Um, you know, just continuing to give back. That's one concept. The other one is swag. And so you you, you hear the young kids talking about swag and things like that. So we (laughs) made an uh, acronym out of swag. And so it stands for systems, wealth or work ethic appeal and growth. And so just to go through that really quick. So systems, we encourage our young men to develop a system for their life to be successful because you can't just wake up every day and have no clue what you're doing and reach Mm -hmm. any level of success. And so we teach systems. And then of course, work ethic, we feel is something that is lacking um, in the younger generation. And so we Mm want to build that back up and teach these young men how to really work and go out and get what they want out of life. The appeal is how you carry yourself. So we see all of these young men, you know, walking around with their pants hanging around their ankles and right. all of that. And so uh, the way that you carry yourself, the way that you dress, the way you speak, making eye contact, the way you shake someone's hand, you know, that's your appeal. Um, mm-hmm. And then the G is for growth and grounding your spirituality, making sure that you're always striving for more, but at the same time, keeping a close connection with, with your spirit. Mm-hmm. And so that, those are two. The last two is a business plan for your life. And so just like as a business owner, you would sit down and you would break down all of the advantages you have, all of the disadvantages you have, your five-year goals, your projections. We encourage men and young men to develop a plan for themselves. Mm -hmm. And then the last concept is having one intentional year because however long you've been living, no matter how many mistakes you've made, if you can get one year right, you can change your entire life. And Mm -hmm. so those are four concepts that we're working on and that we want to promote on a wide scale. And I just want, you know, it's just kind of a last thought. What are your thoughts on that? And is there anything that we could add or or, or tweak to make that better? Wow. That, I mean, it sounds awesome already. I I can't think of anything that you all need to, um, to add. I would say one of the things maybe, um, in those informative years is, is, uh, respect for women and mm-hmm. dealing with the relationships with, um, the opposite sex or the same sex. Um, because we see that a lot now, there are a lot of young men, unfortunately, that do not respect women and there is a lot of domestic violence going on. And so I think you kind of cover that. Because it can start as young, you know, as young as yeah. five years old, respecting, respecting their mother, respecting their grandparents, you know, all of those individuals, those females that are in their lives, respecting them um, and showing that. I think that would that piece there would help um, because then maybe we wouldn't see it so much. Definitely. And I got that written down. but otherwise you got you got a really good start there and it sounds really really good really good thank you so much i appreciate that and i really appreciate your time and so for everyone who's been tuning in we appreciate you please do us a favor and share this video we need as many people as possible to get this message because these children need us they need Mm -hmm. our help and 
it may not be you, but it may be someone that you know. And so it's easy to just click the button, hit share, um, like, you know, heart, leave all the expressions that you can because we also yes. want uh, Facebook and YouTube and these other social media platforms to understand that we're having good, worthwhile conversations here. Yes. You can go on YouTube and you can Google or you can search anything that's foolish um, or unimportant and you can see millions and millions of views, but conversations like this, things that will actually help build our communities and change our futures, get very, very little recognition. And so we want to try to change that. So help us out, do your part, share this message, like it, and, uh, you know, tune in. Whenever you see these live streams pop up, I guarantee you um, it's not going to be any mess. It's going to be something important and, <laughs> and life enhancing. And so uh, yes. before you go, Ms. Brown, uh, any last words, final thoughts, and how can they get in touch with you and your organization to help out? Well, I first thank you for allowing me this opportunity to come and talk about um, the the work that I do um, with children and families. And um, one way to reach out to me is um, through my work email. It's Jacqueline, J-A-C-Q-U-E-L-I-N-E dot brown at great, G-R-E-A-T circle all one word dot org so jacqueline brown jacqueline dot brown at great circle dot org um, my office number is 816-255-1503 and so you can reach me there and we can have some conversations about how you can help great circle and help support our our children that we serve um, or i can tell you a little bit more about what what our other needs may be Awesome. And I went ahead and put that information in the chat, depending on where you're viewing this from, it's streaming from a few different places. And so if you don't see her information, you can go to the Elevating Men's Facebook page, the A.O. Johnson Life Insurance Agency Facebook page. This is also streaming live on our YouTube channels because we want to get the message out. And so, again, thank you very much, everyone. We appreciate you. Have a nice evening. All right. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Thank you.